Hello and welcome. My name is Caitlin Stewart, and today we will be considering how to evaluate sources using the TRAP method. This method is also occasionally called the CRAP method, though they are the same. So if you're already familiar with one or the other, keep that in mind. Before we get going, there will be an activity in this module, so make sure that you have either a writing utensil and paper or a document to type in before we proceed. We are going to be covering how to evaluate the credibility of sources using the research question, how have various stakeholders responded to Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces as the city has grown in population? But before we get too deep into this, we need to answer why source evaluation is important. The main reason why source evaluation is important is because the credibility of the sources that we use and how we use them reflects directly on our credibility as writers. Essentially, you are only as trustworthy as your least trustworthy source, so long as you are supporting that source and not refuting it. It is important to know, however, that credibility is contextual. Sources are held to different standards based on the context in which they exist. For example, a news article you might reference in a blog post you might not use in a dissertation, and a scientific study on the ecology of Seattle's parks you may or may not share with your family. As you evaluate sources, you always need to have your specific context in mind, as well as the goals behind your work. The method of source evaluation covered today is TRAP, standing for Timeliness, Relevance, Authority, Accuracy, and Purpose. We will now move into Timeliness. The first factor to consider is timeliness. How current is the resource? You want to look at both the publication date, especially the year, and the currency of the information the source itself is talking about. If you look closely at the source on the left, written in 1999, much of the essay is actually about events in 1903. This might be perfect for your context, but if you are trying to write about the modern state of parks in Seattle, it likely would not, and the 2017 Parks and Open Space Plan might serve you better. What would be an appropriate timeliness for a given topic varies based on both topic and context. Do you need a historical perspective or to track a change over time? If so, you might need sources that range from very old to quite recent. Are you looking at a specific time period that the resource ought to belong to? If you were looking at how parks in Seattle changed between 1910 and 1925, your sources ought to reflect that. Even if you are writing based on information that should be the most recently available that you can find, what is considered recent varies. Sometimes you will hear people say, published in the last five years. This is a good ballpark figure, but it would likely be shortened to more recently for science, politics, medicine, and more extended for history and English. Again, it all depends on context. You also need to consider whether or not any information in the source is outdated. Ask yourself, are there any facts or figures that no longer hold true? Realize that you can use outdated figures or facts as long as you tie them to their context and time. For example, it would be perfectly appropriate for me to say, in 1900, the population of the city of Seattle was X number of people according to the decennial population census. I might also say something like, there are eight parks in so or so region of the city in 1917. Where this gets tricky is figuring out what information remains true and what is outdated. If you are reading a source on the number of parks in Seattle that was written in 2018, is that up to date? For information such as this, you might be better served using web-based materials such as on the City of Seattle's website, because many of these resources are dynamic resources and are updated regularly. You also need to see if any arguments that the source makes have been widely disproven or maligned within the discipline. Sometimes a scholar or author will make an argument that many others disagree with and argue is incredible. In this way, use time to your advantage by checking responses to a source. Make sure that you look for verification from other sources if possible. Know that different formats or resources have slower or faster publication cycles. A blog post can be written and published very quickly, but writing a book on the same topic would take much longer. Keeping in mind the various ecosystems of different source formats is important when considering the timeliness of a resource. 
The first sources to be published after an event are those on the internet, television, or radio. Someone who records an event happening on their phone could have it shared on social media within a matter of moments. Likewise, live coverage or coverage immediately following a given event will commonly be addressed on the TV or the radio. News articles tend to be the next thing to be published, often be uh, being published in the days following an event. More and more now, we are seeing living newspaper articles on the internet that are being updated in real time, but those would fall into the first and faster type of information source. Magazines follow these articles weeks later because they are reliant on when the magazine is due to be published. Then, scholarly journals often take a matter of months. This is because scholarly journals often require peer review and a much more robust research process. Peer review means that after an article is written, it is sent to other experts in the field to provide feedback. Then the article is published, rejected, or edited based on that feedback. This means that an article published in May 2020 would have information in it that is actually much older. Books take the longest amount of time to publish, and not only because they often have the most amount of words to be written, the writing process is longer, but so is the editing and publishing process. This means that a book written would be pulling from information and sources that are actually much older than the book. So what does this mean for considering the timeliness of a source's format? Basically, you can be slightly more lenient with the publication date of formats on the left-hand side of the screen, but should be more strict for those on the right. The second factor to consider when evaluating the credibility of your source is the relevance of the source to your research and what you are using the source to support in your own work. There are two main aspects to this. First, is the source relevant to your research topic? I think many of us are guilty in the research process of finding a couple of sources that are roughly relevant to our research and then spending a lot of time and energy stretching and twisting those sources so that we can use them. Sources exist on this scale of relevancy. Most people would not try to use a source that is not very relevant, but people often will try to use a source that is only kind of relevant or pretty relevant. Using one highly relevant source is preferable to using multiple of any other kind. This is because the information you get from the highly relevant source will be better at supporting your argument. You can also use one highly relevant source to find more by looking at sources at sites or related readings. Second, the information you pull from a source must be directly relevant to the argument you are making. Stating that all of Seattle's neighborhoods are losing green spaces, but supporting it only with a quote that states South Seattle is losing green space does not have relevant support for your claim. It would be more persuasive to use research for that claim which shows green space coverage and distribution citywide. Then you could humanize those experiences by showing the effects that green space loss in South Seattle had on various residents. The third factor to consider is authority. Who is the author, publisher, source, or sponsor of the source you are considering? What are their credentials? Be careful when considering the second question. Just because someone does not have a PhD does not mean that they are not a credible source. Credentials can look different ways and mean different things. Experience can come in many different forms. A city planner analyzing how to maximize green space while keeping up with a growing population, you might expect to have a degree, but from other sources such as residents of Seattle or construction teams, they are credible to provide information with or without a degree so long as the information they share is appropriate to their experience. You might also consider their reputation. If they are a scholar, are they respected or does everyone else in the field disagree with them? If they are a primary source, meaning they are providing a first-hand account of an experience, does their account differ from other primary sources? The answers to these questions might not always be clear. However, that is why we rely on multiple sources, and the balance of those sources is something you ought to consider. A good way to think about this is by imagining that the authors of your sources are people speaking on a panel about your topic. You might ask yourself, who is missing? Are certain voices or perspectives over or underrepresented? For our question, how have various stakeholders responded to Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces as the city has grown in population? Voices might include developers, ecologists, reporters, residents, city planners, and parks and recreation government employees, but many other voices could be included as well. 
You do not necessarily need to include all relevant voices, because in many cases that might be out of scope or impossible, but you should consider the impact that an exclusion might have on your research and the arguments you can responsibly make. A paper with the same question that focused most heavily on the perspective of developers would contrast significantly with one written more from an ecological perspective. The fourth factor to consider is accuracy. This is often the easiest factor to understand, but can be one of the hardest to detect. Much of this is tied to your gut reaction. Does something factual sound incorrect? Does it completely disagree with research you've seen elsewhere? A good way to approach deciding whether something is accurate is first looking to see if the source is supported by evidence. Does it cite the information it is using, or does it provide some type of evidence to show that the account is trustworthy? You might also consider whether or not the information has been reviewed or refereed. This would mean that others judge the information as trustworthy. Peer-reviewed articles are a common example of this and let you be more confident in your use of a given source. But just because a source is not reviewed or refereed does not mean that it, it is not accurate. A good way to see if a source is accurate is by trying to verify the information with another source or with your own personal knowledge. If an eyewitness describes an event and their account disagrees with 75 other people's, then you might not trust it as factually accurate. Similarly, if a source publishes information that many other sources that you find disagree with, you might consider whether or not the source is accurate. It is important to remember that many topics are under debate. Do not confuse topics with facts. Oftentimes, there's not one unifying understanding of something within a topic. For example, it is a fact that cats are animals, but people might disagree over whether or not dogs or cats make better pets. Using a source that argues either way on the debate is fine, but you would not want us to use a source that suggested that cats are not animals. The fifth factor is purpose. Why did the author write this resource? Do they need an enticing article so that lots of people click on it? Do they need to publish an article to keep their job? Are they trying to convince you or others to support a cause? When you consider the purpose behind why someone is writing, you can more easily see how that purpose might sway what they say. Ask yourself, is the information fact, opinion, or propaganda? A source on green space in Seattle that is written by a developer is likely to be motivated by business interests. You also want to consider whether or not the point of view appears objective and impartial. It is impossible to be totally without bias, but sources can be accurate and still biased. Common types of biases are political, ideological, cultural, religious, institutional, or personal. Some of these can be more overt than others. It is often more easy to see certain biases such as political than other biases such as cultural. If you share a bias with the writer, it is often easy to classify a bias source as unbiased. Be aware of your own bias and constantly check in with yourselves. We can all pick and choose facts that paint a certain picture and are more likely to believe facts that create a picture that we like. It is important to consider whether or not your source is attempting to be objective by showing both sides. If the source is taking a side, that does not mean you should not use it, but you need to hold the information in the context of its bias. It is often a good sort a good choice to look at both sides to get a more comprehensive understanding. You want to make sure that your paper is not accidentally polluted by the biases of others. The reason we care about evaluating sources for credibility so much is because the credibility of the sources that we use and how we use them reflect directly on our credibility as writers. Now it's time to put this method to the test with an activity. If you already have a research question and a source, feel free to use those for this activity. Otherwise, imagine you are using the source linked in the text comment of this voice thread as a resource for the research question, how have various stakeholders responded to Seattle's initiatives and approaches to creating and preserving green spaces as the city has grown in population? Either on a piece of blank paper or in a blank document, write out trap. After reading or skimming the resource, for each letter, write out whether or not you think the source passes in the given context and why. While working on this, feel free to look over past slides to help you remember key details. 
I estimate that this process should take roughly 15 minutes. Don't feel obligated to read the entire source from start to finish now. Just look for key clues that could help you evaluate the source using TRAP. When you finish this evaluation, continue on to the next slide. The easiest way to remember the factors used to decide whether or not a source is credible in your context is to remember, don't fall for a trap. The five factors are timeliness, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. And remember, considering something as a bad or good source detached from a given context is an oversimplification. When considering each of these factors, you need to keep in mind your own goals and purpose. I hope this module has helped give you some clarity in how to evaluate the credibility of a source. Thank you so much for your time.